It's not nuclear science, varicose veins, but um, it affects more women sufferers than all the gynecological conditions because it's so common. So um, somebody worked out once the sufferance level from all the conditions you've heard about, urinary incontinence and that, per capita of women, women in the population. And varicose veins, although it doesn't kill anyone, um, the suffering level was, because there's so many people with it, one of the highest uh, of all the, the conditions we've been talking about. So it's something that's worth actually um, looking at carefully because since the days when I was a junior surgeon, uh, nothing changed in the treatment of varicose veins for years. No one really thought about anything more than, oh, high time strip. And then the Americans came up with a different, completely radical method, and we're going to discuss that. Now, first of all, I'm really going to talk about the etiology of varicose veins, and then we'll come on to the treatment. Okay, it's a, everyone's got valves in their veins. When we stood up, and I'm told it was about 10 million years ago, <coughs> the valves hadn't actually reached the level of taking the, the high back pressure when they heat. So well, we got varicose veins. And the skin veins can become incompetent to cause varicose veins, and the deep veins can become incompetent. Um, for those of you who've ever had a small car, like I've still got a Morris Minor, <laughs> if you're on the motorway and you're trying to overtake a huge lorry, you get sucked in a bit, and you have to hold the steering wheel the other way. And that is exactly how the our skin veins drain their blood into the deep veins. It's a Anyone's good at physics, well, I have to look it up. It's the Bernoulli principle. Okay, a fast-moving object sucks in the slower moving things into its stream. And what happens with, when the veins go on the, on, the, on the skin veins, you get a back leak. And every time you stand up, it, the veins bulge, the next valve starts leaking, they're every 10 centimeters or so, and you end up with huge veins. Most patients actually come showing me the veins on their ankle, but uh, that's because there's very little fat on the ankle and they become most obvious there, but the problem's higher up. Okay, these are the main causes, and there's hundreds of causes, but these ones here are the ones that actually um, mostly come to me with uh, these sort of varicose veins. Don't think that it's only women, by the way. All the professional footballers have varicose veins at the end of their career. Um, it's just they don't talk about it. Um, <laughs> Uh, obesity is, the, you know, obesity actually is a cause of varicose veins, but in the very obese people, you can't, they don't present early, they present with skin changes. And then a lot of people have none of these, and they're just older, and the valves start leaking. Okay, let's go to it historically. The top, uh, the, my, one of my professors who trained me, all he did was tie the top end, and that took five minutes, and then he wondered why it took me 20 minutes to do a varicose veins operation, because I was stripping them. But the, it's, no, it's not quite as easy as that. The, the superficial veins have communications with the deep veins. So if you don't take out the long saphenous vein, for example, which is varicose, you're just asking for recurrent veins. So when the professor retired and I became senior registrar, I was doing all his recurrences. But he wasn't there for me to, to tell. <laughs> he retired up to Scotland. Okay, then, so then ligation and stripping of varicose veins, veins became the normal treatment. Now, this may sound quite standard, and all of you have seen these operations, I'm sure, had it done, and uh, to yourself. And <laughs> this was actually, no one ever thought about it. Vasculistas aren't quite stupid people, but uh, you know, sometimes you just block out, what are we doing? Until somebody came with the idea, why are we removing the long saphenous? Yes, we understand it's got to be defunctioned, but why not kill it and leave it in the leg? You kill it inside you. And so um, the Americans came up with this venous, which is really sophisticated microwave fiber. So it, it burns the inside of the vein, the blood clots, and that's it. So you haven't done any stripping, and that's far more comfortable for the patient. Uh, so you can, that had to be done usually initially under general anesthetic. And then we moved on to EVLA, which stands for endovenous laser ablation. So um, a laser does the burning. It's far faster. Um, it can be done purely under local, and we'll come to that. Uh, but it, uh, it, you can just walk in, have it done, walk out. Um, it isn't pain-free, and although it's advertised as that, uh, bishops would, um, I tend to do all of them under sedation, but it's a short day case, and patients much prefer to be sedated than wide awake, because uh, they don't like the clatter in theater and the buzzy sounds of the laser, and they don't like wearing the spectacles, you know, which they have to wear. 
the laser proof goggles. Okay, so we always do a duplex scan, right? There's no question of dealing with varicose veins without a duplex scan. Uh, in many trials, 50% of consultant vascular surgeons got the leakage point wrong between long and short saphenous. So it's very easy to get the wrong thing and do the wrong operation. But with a duplex scan, you get a proper map of it and you know exactly you know, what operation you need to do. And it, it just, it's a, it, it's, it makes it very simple. You can tell the patient in the consulting room exactly what they're going to have done. Um, the third point here is the pelvic vein incompetence. This comes into the um, gynecology field, I'm afraid. It's veins that appear typically in the groin and the back of the thigh, and they're very difficult to deal with because they're thought to be ovarian vein links with um, the veins in the leg, the superficial veins in the leg. And all you can offer these patients is that you will tidy it up and then keep them okay by injecting the veins subsequently over the years but they'll never be totally free of veins. Okay, now why do we treat them at all? Um, in the United States, actually, if we go down to the skin changes and ulceration point, they did a very big study, and the, the cost of treating leg ulcers in the community in the United States is $2.2 billion a year. Now, that's pretty big money, because there's lots of other things that need treating in the community, but that alone should be a reason. Um, currently, the NHS have called it cosmetic, but cosmetic today means ulcers when they're older. So all we're doing is building up a big backlog of, you know, bombs to explode. Phlebitis is one of the commonest reasons this, um, we are allowed to now do veins on the NHS. But anyone who gets symptomatic veins, they get pain and they're free of pain for a few weeks, that is actually a phlebitis. You don't have to have a bond or obvious swelling of a superficial vein. That's a thrombophlebitis. So I take the form and everyone who complains of pain has had a phlebitis at some stage. And, you know, I've sent them up, the bits of vein up for um, histology and they come back as inflammation. So they are getting mild attacks of phlebitis. Uh, the skin changes leading to ulceration is bound or obvious. Bleeding is very dramatic for the patient. Most patients who knock their varicose veins on their ankle and bleed, for some reason, tend to sit up and press on it, not lie down and press on it. So it makes quite a mess of their bedroom and, uh, you know, lots of 999 calls. Okay, now, I, I do all these as day cases at Bishop's Wood, um, and it, it's done under local even for bilateral veins. Um, I, I always have an anaesthetist present to sedate the patient because, as I've said, they, they love that, the fact that they're talking but can't remember it. Um, and it's very, it, there's not much pain, but it's not painful. They tend to be, I operate on Thursdays, they're driving um, on Sunday. Okay, legally driving, because I've said they can. Um, so uh, if they can walk, they can drive. It's just slamming the brake on that uh, needs to be thought about. So it's a very quick return to walk, work. Most of the patients still want two or three weeks off. And if you tell them you can go back to work on a Monday, they, they start umming and eyeing about the whole thing. <laughs> so I've learned from that. Uh, now, it isn't free of complications, and in fact, although I said infection is rare, I probably wouldn't see the small infections in the phlebectomy sites, you would see them, because they don't necessarily come back to me and say, I, you know, I've got an infection here. They go to their GP, get some antibiotics, and not necessarily referred back to me uh, because of that. But in my experience, one in 20 gets very trivial phlebectomy wound infections, and I've only had one readmission in nine years, and that was a patient who had an he infected hematoma in the groin who needed a general anaesthetic to sort out. Now, numbness is very common, um, in very common in the sense that's one of the things they complain about, but usually resolves in time, and it's just the phlebectomies can damage small, tiny cutaneous nerves. Um, some people have said it's a heat injury, but as I'll show you, we have ways of getting around that. Recurrence, is it a complication? Well, to me it is. I mean, you know, it's, a, it's an issue where we know the anatomy, we have the means of treating it, they shouldn't really recur. Um, but they do. Nature is such, and if you put a dam up somewhere, a river will get around it. And bleeding is very simple to control because you just put a bandage on it. You can't do that with thyroids, my anesthetist was telling the patient, but you're having varicose veins. Now, I'm not going to discuss thread veins and spider veins here because they're not technically varicose veins, but as you know, they're quite treatable by injection. Um, in, in, this, in the NHS here in this country, we haven't looked at the cost, and I don't think we'd get an accurate figure anyway, the cost to health services, which is mainly primary care costs, I should think. Um, but it is a very, very big expense. They need readmissions to hospital, 
some of them have to be admitted for a uh, you know, nursing home because they can't be managed at home. And uh, we're going to face big problems very soon, you know, even in, not in my working life, but I'd probably be one of the patients who's um, you know, got leg ulcers and then, you know, <laughs> some of you younger people looking at us. Um, now, I'm just going to go through endovenous laser operation. It is the treatment of choice, certainly in this country and more and more uh, in the United States, and the venous has become you know, left behind. The, the costs are the same. The venous machine is cheaper, the, the disposable fibers are more expensive, the laser machine is more expensive, but the laser fibers are cheaper. So there's not a big cost business. Um, with the current veins, many patients come and they want the laser. Well, light travels in a straight line, and if you've got a, a really tortuous recurrence, you're not even going to get the laser fiber down it. So they have to be told that they're not going to be done, you know, they're going to be done the old fashioned way. Now, here's the uh, schematic um, diagram. Is there a pointer here? Yes, I can use the mouse. Um, okay, now this is the normal vein. Okay, there's the laser fiber, disposable, everything's disposable now. Um, and around here, this, th these bits on the side, is a, a heat sink of lignocaine, okay, uh, made up in saline, very dilute lignocaine. So it encompasses the veins, no pain, but more importantly, no burning of the skin or, or surrounding fat. So the heat is concentrated within the vein. Um, and as the, I mean, when it says vein, vein warmed, I mean, it's instantaneous. If, you, if you've ever had a laser burn, which, I mean, you know, shouldn't have one, actually. But if, if you ever put your finger, you'll see how hot it is. So it immediately destroys the vein. And the vein collapses, as in here, okay? It becomes like a piece of string, almost. And as you, you slowly withdraw the catheter. That um, process from starting the burn to taking the burn out takes about, what, 40 seconds, okay? And uh, the patient is bandaged because you've got to do some phlebectomies. With, this is just the main long saphenous. Now some slides, I'm sorry they're pixelated on this. They're very nice on this screen. <laughs> Before and after, okay? This patient, you can see the skin changes at the top. Not very far of getting an ulcer. Um, very difficult actually to get a cosmetic result, but to, to make the skin stable. And that's after treatment. <laughs> uh, okay. It might be a holiday photograph. <laughs> we can't do that, you see, but the patient expects this afterwards. So you've got to tell them this is not going to happen, all right? Um, so, okay, more honest before and afterward. All right, that's a patient with quite marked long saphenous varicose veins of the left leg. Afterwards, um, they're gone, okay? Uh, but more importantly, there's hardly any scars to show. It's not the greatest slides, but. There's, there's not many. They, most patients then don't like this. They've got veins here, if you look at the first slide, the veins on the dorsum of the foot. I personally, they get smaller. I don't put, uh, pull them out or anything because the scars there can be extremely painful for years with a pair of tight shoes on. Um, so I, 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 I warn them of that. And most people, you know, of this age group, don't wear um, sort of flimsy uh, high heels and that, so they don't mind. Here's another one. This is done, um, this is the, second, the second after slide as well, it is taken um, a week after the operation. This, the marks here, the scars are still the phlebectomy scars. Oh, no, my, no, 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 back um, the phlebectomy scars are there, okay, you can see them. That's me with the laser fiber. Um, the glasses are what the, um, those glasses cost about 120 pounds each. I mean, you know, they, they, they don't last that long in the sense that they get lost on things. But at Bishopswood, they changed them from um, pink ones to darker ones, which you can hardly see. And then you forget you've got them on. And you finish the lasering, you're closing the skin with these glasses on. And the nurse, everyone's taking their glasses off. And then you're wondering why you can't see anything. <laughs> um, so, but this, by the way, the light um, of the laser fiber measure is not the laser itself. Okay? There's a lot of the special doors you need in theater and signs and things. That is just the warning light to show that the machine is now switched on, okay? Um, so you've got to still press a foot pedal to make it work. Um, and then you've got time, and the patient gets their own pair of glasses, and sometimes they like a photograph of them with their glasses on, on the operating table. And that is it, okay? If anyone has any questions. <laughs> Um, 
Thank you very much for the talk. And you make a very important point that um, if you don't ver treat varicose veins now, it's going to cause a problem in the future. Uh, but given the current climate, um, what advice would you give about the conservative management of varicose veins in the community? Just some basic tips. Well, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, if they're generally, if they're not fit for surgery, the conservative management would be a graded compression stocking. But the people who are not fit for surgery can't put the stocking on because they can't reach their leg or their, their grip's not very good. So you're in a catch-22. No one can put a stocking on your leg. Only the person who owns that leg can properly put a graded compression stocking on. So I've, you know, folks, husbands standing behind their wife when they're 75, something, trying to get a stocking on, they'll both fall over. <laughs> so I give it up. But so that, there's, there's no real, if they're fit for surgery, this is local anesthetic. I mean, local anesthetic, a short day case, is less complicated than some hair cutting sessions. You know, so why shouldn't they have that done? And that would still save a lot of money because over a patient's lifetime, if they're using stockings, it's a lot of, they cost about 80 pounds a pair. So, and they wear out every three months. So you've got a lot of expense there. So I think that in this day and age, we shouldn't talk about you know, conservative measures, but that is the only conservative measure, really. Injecting purple varicose veins like we've seen on these slides it doesn't work because you haven't taken out the leak at the top. Hi, I, are you saying that we essentially need to be telling our patients that they need to save up for a private operation? Uh, no, no, I think I mean, the NHS should be dealing with these. They, they should, but they're not. So it does put us in a, it's very a difficult, bit of a difficult situation, doesn't it? I don't, I mean, I must say, you know, the, the patients who are in the worst position aren't the young people who are earning money and all that. These are retired people. And when they come and see me privately, I try my damnedest to say, look, you know, this is the situation. You should be done on the NHS, and I'll back that up. Um, uh, but then, of course, you know, the, the, the husband always says, I want to pay for my wife, and I feel really bad about it because, you know, it's not my role to do it. But um, they should be referred, uh, and if they can be referred on the NHS, all the better. But if, if you can't tick a box then and send them to me privately, I'll tick the box. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, I, I'm not sure. If, if, no, you can. Ref the question was, we can't refer, we're not allowed to refer the patients. But you can if they've got phlebitis, if they've got a skin changes, if they've got a leg ulcer. Th those things you can refer them for. It's not a blanket no referral, but if it's purely cosmetic, then I agree that you, you'll be told you can't refer. The purely cosmetic veins aren't usually big ones. They're tiny little things. You know, they're varicose veins, but they're not thread veins, but they're not something really bad. Uh, in the past, we, we were used to be told that if you've got a, a woman who hasn't completed her family and she's got very prominent varicose veins, um, but they're not necessarily causing a huge amount of GIP at that point to hold up until she's completed her family because they could recur. If, are you saying now with the laser treatment that we could perhaps get them to have it done prior to them completing their families? Well, you, yes, even with the old-fashioned stripping, you could do it prior to that. Um, it's also very difficult because, you know, some, some women haven't finished completing a family, but then they decide they have, you know, because they find the financial burden. <laughs> oh, God, I have to speak from personal experience, actually. And then, so it's better to deal with it when they've got a gap in their life, which is convenient. And if they get pregnant again, well, you know, if you've done it well, then it won't recur. But if it does recur, well, we'll deal with it. The cost of, of the whole procedure. Um, well, I, I, at Bishopswood, they do sort of a blanket charge which covers everything. And um, since it's done as a short day case, it, it's the disposables mainly. I think it comes to about between three and four and a half thousand pounds. Per leg? Sorry? Per leg. <laughs> we do a cut price on the second. <laughs> Not quite a cut price, okay? <laughs> painful symptoms, it's straightforward to decide on surgery, but um, now we've handed the questionnaires in, should they be done on pigmentation alone? Should they be, sorry? If they've got hemosiderin pigmentation, yes. is that an indication to... It, I mean, that's, a, that's an indication for referral. They still need a duplex scan, because a lot of the more elderly patients, the hemosiderin is due to deep venous incompetence, 
as an aging thing, not necessarily a previous DBT, then obviously we can't do anything about that. Um, so they should be referred at least, yes. Uh, it depends how long they're going to live. If they've got no symptoms and they're 18, 85 and hardly mobile, it's slightly different. But if they're fit, active eight-year-olds, yes, they should be referred. Thanks, Joe.